Learning guitar isn't always what you think it's going to be. Today, I'm sharing with you the three things that could have saved me years of spinning my wheels if I had only known. So stay tuned for episode 300. Hello and welcome, friends, to episode 300 of the Play Guitar Podcast. I'm Lee, and this is the podcast that's determined to make you a better guitar player. No matter if you're just starting out or you've been playing for years, this is the show that will help you become the guitarist that you always wanted to be. And if you're new here, subscribe. Subscribe to the podcast and check out the description. There's stuff in there for all the links from the show. Uh, Today's episode is brought to you by Play Guitar Coaching, my coaching program. This is my one-on-one program where I get to the bottom of your problems on the guitar, I speed up your learning, and I keep you pointed in the right direction so you get used to achieving your most important goals over and over and over again. It is uh, a lot of fun. This coaching program uh, changed it up a few months ago and it's going fantastic. We're having a lot of really cool uh, group classes as well. We have uh, times throughout the month where we get together, private times, and then other times we do these group classes, and it's been awesome, awesome. And I just wanted to let you know about this because if you're thinking about it, now is the time. I can only take on so many private students, so if it's something you've been on the fence about, um, head over to the link. It's in a description. It's playguitaracademy.com forward slash play dash guitar dash coaching you just click on the link in the description basically just fill out some information for me and i'll get back to you and we'll see if it's a good fit so a big smile on my face today this is a this is this is an awesome day this is something i've been looking forward to for a long time and it is really really crazy how everything happened today so i'm recording this it's tuesday let's see here the seventh the day before this normally goes out and last week I took a week off. It's getting a little burned out. <laughs> so I took a little uh, personal time, did a little self-care for a week and um, I'm back to work. Yesterday I was back to work and got, was getting things together and I knew episode 300 was coming up and I was like, man, I want to celebrate this. Uh, and uh, so there were some things that I was keeping an eye on. And one of the things was the downloads for this podcast. So this podcast has been creeping towards 1 million downloads for a while now. My all-time download number was of this morning, 930,907. But for a while there, they did Spotify downloads separate in a separate column. So I checked the Spotify downloads and that was 69,091. So for you quick math people, (laughs) what is it? That is 999,998. Now that was, let's see, that was about an hour ago. So uh, if two people listen to the podcast between now and then, I I, I actually know, I checked it. It is, uh, we have hit 1 million downloads. So thank you for uh, coming back time and time again. Thanks for going back and listening to all the episodes And thanks for joining me. And this is big phase one. And what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be moving into phase two. Already have moved into phase two. Most likely be listening to this on Wednesday. That's when most people do. We're going to be starting Play Guitar TV on the YouTube channel. I'm going to be going, I'm going to do it weekdays at first. I may do it all the time. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, But I'm going to be starting weekdays in the afternoon. I'm going to be spending time with you every afternoon on YouTube. It's going to be a lot of fun. This week, we are going to be taking a look at the spark. I'm going back into the spark camp. So this is just going to be diving into it and getting some sounds and seeing what's the best way to do it. Now I'll just be doing it. We're going to go live uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week. And then next week we may finish it up. So, uh, so new fun stuff is happening today. It's really, really fantastic. And, and just the fact this episode 300, can you believe it? 300 episodes. This is this is fantastic. Today's episode, this is kind of a common one. You hear a lot of people do this. So I wish what I wish I would have known then what I know now. Right. And so I and I deal with that a lot. I deal with uh, students that come in and I, I try to help them not have to go through it, not have to go through 
the hard knocks, not have to go through the time consuming thing, the things that take months and years before you see progress. Try to help them with that. I'm turning the tables <laughs> back on myself. I'm going to take a look at what, for me, what are the things that I wish I would have known? Things that could have sped things up for me, or at least made things less confusing. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Looking back, I've gone into learning something with a guitar. And I've learned that the guitar doesn't have any rules. There's no board, an authority board of stuffy people <laughs> who decide what's the correct way to do the guitar. What's the best way to come be, to become great at the guitar? What are the best practices for guitar? It's all over the place. Uh, when I started that, I didn't realize that. I thought, okay, I'll just do what I'm supposed to do. And then eventually over time, things will get pretty good. But I didn't realize I was on my own. And that's fine for me. Because I'm a DIY kind of person. I like to do, you know, learn how to do things myself. I enjoy, you know, figuring things out. And I enjoyed the experimentation of learning the guitar. But I did it at a price. And that price was time. I spent months and years on some things going down some paths that looking back now, I never should have done that. Uh, I, I wasn't ready for some things, and it, it wasn't something that put me closer to the to what I was born to do, to the things that I needed to do on the guitar. Here's some of the things I well, <laughs> uh, I tried to learn: square neck dobro, you know, the one that you put on your lap and use the, the the steel bar on that for a while. I spent a lot of time trying to learn to to do that. I I loved listening to the the square neck resonator sounds, and I wanted to be able to do it myself. I uh, but after a, a, a few years, I realized it's not for me. That's not, <laughs> that's not, not what I was put here to do. Uh, I tried with mandolin. I tried with banjo. I tried all of those things. It, it all happened the same way. I tried with harmonica at one point. I tried to play the harmonica and I just would turn blue. I almost passed out. My wife had to tell me, you need to put that down. <laughs> right? So I was trying to do the cross harp thing. Just didn't work out for me. It wasn't for me. But even in my instrument of choice, which is, you know, the guitar, I've been surprised by what I actually needed to know and what I didn't need to know. And what's unfortunate for me is that it took a long time. It took many years to learn these things on my own. So today I'm going to share three, the three for 300, right? I'm going to share three, the three big things that I found that could have saved me years of time and guided me to a more successful journey had I started them sooner. So what's the first one? The first one that I didn't realize is that going it on your own is slow. So when you're learning the guitar, you're focused. You're focused on what you're doing at the time, but you're distracted from other things. You're dist distracted from some things that are important, some things that you need to, to really keep your, your finger on. Uh, when you're on your own, you have to wear a couple hats to be successful. There's, there's, there's a few different uh, uh, jobs that have to be done to keep this guitar playing moving forward. Uh, I like to call it the dreamer is one of them. The planner is the other one. And then the practicer. We all start off as the guy who has that vision, right? The dreamer. But what happens? That doesn't last long. That quickly turns into the guy who does the work, the practicer. So we have this dream of doing something. We really want to do it. And we say, well, what's the first thing I have to do? And then you, you buckle down, you start practicing, you practicing, practicing. There's a problem with that, though. You've got your head down. You're, you're in it. You're focused, right? You get your head down all the time. And when you do that, when you have your head down all the time and not steering the boat, you can get lost. I used to run cross country. We would run in the woods. A good bit. And I remember I'd be running and just looking at the path in front of me, just like a foot or two in front of me, or lo looking at my feet. You can do this walking, you know, walking, looking at your feet in the woods, and you're just following the path, and all you're seeing is a few feet ahead of you. You're not looking where you're going. You look up after a while and you're lost. You don't know where, how did I get here? I was just following the path, but this isn't where I wanted to be. Or you could think of it like driving. Have, do you ever do that? You, you're driving down the road and you're watching, I don't know, maybe watching the little uh, markers, the lane markers go by. 
The next thing you know, you missed your exit. We've all done that. You guys might be doing it right now. I know there's a lot of people back and forth to work doing that. Or you could be listening to the podcast and I say something silly. And then next thing you know, you got to go to the next exit and turn around. You're not looking where you're going. You're just focusing on the task at hand. Then what do you got to do? You got to course correct. You got to backtrack and you're losing time and you're losing focus. You might say with your guitar playing, oh, that didn't work. Or you might get to a point where you're doing a lot of work, you're doing some stuff, and then all of a sudden you realize, I'm not enjoying this anymore. Why am I doing this in the first place? And we've all felt that. With coaching, it's the little things of coaching. Now, there's in coaching, we have, uh, for each person, we go in and I, I set them in a certain direction, right? So there's a big thing. And then we also have some weekly things that we all do in the coaching program. Right. These are big things. But for me, the, what's really satisfying about it is like little things like, oh, well, you, you, uh, move your pick over to the side a little bit. They clear up these enormous roadblocks in people's things. It's the little things that can pull you in the wrong direction. I didn't have a coach. I had different guitar teachers. I have one guitar teacher for a while and then another one for a while. But it was focused on the, the practicing at hand. I didn't have somebody to steer my path plan my direction for me, at least let me know what I'm headed for. I had my head down. I was in the woodshed, right? That's what we call our community in the academy, the woodshed, the place where you go to practice, right? If I had someone who could have steered me in the right direction, it would save me years of my time. I was wasting time on working on things for months that I ended up not ever needing, not ever using. The big four, this comes to mind, the big four uh, scales. I spent tons of time working on other scales, exotic scales. Some of them I've never used, <laughs> ever. Uh, and now I'm in a, pro- in a place in my playing where my ear tells me where to go with notes. It's not even a scale. Uh, it's that the, I, my ear hears a certain, there's a certain uh result that I want to get. And then my ear kind of tells me where I want to go. And I end up using a lot of outside notes and inside notes to get what I want to, uh, but I didn't not using those old scales with coaching. It it operates fast. It operates at lightning speed. And this, these little things, these little things that someone might notice and say, Hey, do this or do that, or try this this way. They create a big, and my coaching students will tell you that that's the biggest impact is having someone outside of the focus circle, right? Someone looking in saying, hey, uh, here's something you may not have been thinking about that's little teeny tiny, but that can change things. Hopefully, depending on who your teacher is, there's a, there is a path. But coaching is something different. When I'm doing coaching, I take the personal journey in mind. Even though I do have a basic path that I use for everyone to start with, it changes for everyone after about a month or two. The second thing, that I wish I would have known back then uh, that I know now is that no one cares about how fast you play. (laughs) No one cares. I can play fast. I can play really fast and clean. So I don't remember if I told you this story before there's been 300 episodes. I have no, I, I can't remember what I've told you when I haven't. So I apologize if I've said this before, I probably have, but it fits this. And so it's a good story to illustrate what I'm talking about. And that is the best time that I connected to an audience as a lead guitar player. I remember everything about it. It was July 4th on the mall in Washington, DC. And there was, it was in a little pavilion area that and we were live made a little bit more uh, nerve wracking that it was being broadcast live on XM radio for this show. And I was playing with EG kite and we were playing up there. And I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of times when you play different events, they'll have amplifiers for you there that they call backline. So you don't have to bring your amplifiers. You may be flying in or it may be hard to load in. So uh, basically you would bring your guitar pedals and your guitar and plug into an amp that they have there. And they have companies that, you know, will make sure that the amps are, you know, really nice. And this, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they're, they're terrible. This one happened to be a fantastic, it was a Fender 
uh, it was a twin reverb reissue, one of the 65 reissue things. And it was, you know, sometimes you plug into an amp, it, even with the same amp, you can go from one venue to the next. And it, it, it just uh, one time it sounds great. The other time it doesn't. This amp sounded fantastic. One point I was doing a solo and I played a note and it hit a harmonic. I must have been just standing in the right way, but woo, you know, that kind of thing. And it just hit that. And usually I would cover those up and move on to the next thing. But for some reason, this, I didn't even remember what song it was. For some reason, I just let it ride. I just let it go. And the song kept playing and I'm just letting this one note go. <laughs> and the longer it went, the more people started paying attention. Right. And then I started hearing some, some applause. And then I would kind of, uh, in time, in rhythm, do some things to that note, kind of do a vibrato in rhythm, or I was doing different things, but that one note, it just kept going and going and going. It didn't fade away. What I did with this sustaining one note that got everybody past the clapping and on their feet was that the most basic, simple thing, basic rhythms and timing on one note. It was incredible. And I had played probably a, a thousand notes before that, you know, and, and didn't get that kind of response. So you, you work hard, you try to do all sorts of stuff. You try to learn all the different things. You try to make sure everything's just right, just perfect. And then by accident, you hit one note that hits, gets some feedback, gets a harmonic going and it gets people on their feet. It's it just you know, uh, it was fantastic that it happened, but you go, you go, wow, well, what about all the other stuff I was doing? Right. Uh, but, it, but I think it was the rhythms that it was one note and simple rhythms, rhythm and timing. What's the difference with rhythms are the beat, right? The rhythms are the organization of the notes, how, how they're organized, but timing is how you perform those, those rhythms, getting your timing down is what you need to work on. It's where it's at. It's powerful. You hear some players that are, they might play the same song as someone else, but it sounds completely different. It has a different feel to it, right? Their timing is different how they play. The rhythms might be the same, but the way they play them is different. And if your timing is wrong, people will know. Did I have to play super fast? No, I didn't. You don't either. Trying to play like lightning fast, you know, that's great if that's, if that's in your heart, if that's what you want to do. For someone who just wants to play regular guitar stuff, it's not the most effective use of your time trying to play fast. We try to learn things in order. And until you have a command over these basics, think about the basics I used for that. Rhythms, timing. Uh, if you don't have that together, if you're just trying to play fast and not looking at these basic rhythms and playing them on time and being able to play them certain ways, your fast playing is not gonna be effective. Just because you can move the pick really fast doesn't mean that it's in time and being on time matters to everyone and we all have a heartbeat right we all have something in common so people know nothing about music they know about rhythm it reaches people on a very basic level it reaches all of us it was talking about playing fast there are ways of playing fast these people who uh eric johnson steve vi joe satriani uh they have great rhythm and great timing. Paul Gilbert, these people who are known for playing fast, but when they play fast, it still keeps your attention. What's the thing that, that gives people the biggest problem? Well, we talk about this a lot in coaching and in the academy is called the gap, right? The gap is something that we're always working on. So, so what's the gap, right? The gap is a lot of times if you play slow, right? It's very easy to stay in time. And then we can all play like as fa fast as we can play. Just play as fast as you can play. In the 80s, when I was really looking, learning guitar, uh, they called it what? Fan picking, I think is one of them. <laughs> just just play, play as fast as you can. It's like turning on a fan on high. Play as fast as you can. Uh, doesn't mean that that's correct. But what it, what ends up happening is you've got this slow playing that you can do, and then you've got the super fast playing. And then there's this part in the middle that's kind of a no man's land. We call it the gap. 
And that's where you can play up to a certain point and then you start the clicking, right? <laughs> you, st you start not being able to keep things in time. What we're doing is we find out where your number is, right? Well, how fast can you play cleanly and in time? And then, uh, and we're going to be doing that today in uh, the part two of this, this video and this podcast. The part two, it's in the academy. We're going to be talking about the gap. And I'm going to give you exercises how to shrink the gap, how to push higher towards that fast playing and still be able to play cleanly and close that gap of uh, tempos that you struggle. But it also works for slow tempos, too. Have you ever tried to play super slow, like 40, 50 beats per minute? Right. That is very tough to do. And you have many more opportunities to mess that up because <laughs> there's it's so slow if you're interested in working on that getting your rhythms better i suggest you head over there and check that out my last thing that surprised me now that i wish i had known back then is it's not really about being a guitar player it's about being a musician we're so focused on the guitar because that's our instrument but i found that wasn't enough my goal when I started was to play for people. I wanted to play guitar in front of people. I wanted to be a performer. That's what I want. What did I do? I dove into the songs that I wanted to play, starting learning them any way I could figure out how. Tablature, just uh, trial and error, asking people questions who might have known how to play the songs. I was learning the guitar parts. I didn't know why I was playing these things other than they were part of that song that I wanted to play. Uh, and so I wasn't able to speak the language of that. I was just mimicking. It was like mimicking a foreign language. I was, it, the sounds were coming out. I had no idea what I was doing. I couldn't communicate. And as I started playing in bands, I started seeing it was a much bigger problem than I thought. And the first place that I had struggled to communicate with people was keyboard players. It was in rock bands and it was in jazz bands. That was the one that was super difficult because keyboard players did, don't have frets, right? And my strings are set up differently than a, a keyboard is. And my chord shapes, if you tried to talk to a keyboard player about your chord shapes, about your frets, about your scale patterns, all the things that we work on all the time, it's it makes no sense to them. You're speaking a different language. Then it was uh, horn lines, right? Pe people who played trumpet and saxophone and trombone in these bands that I was playing. Did you know that when you see a band playing that has trumpets and saxophones in it, but also a guitar player and keyboard players, that uh, the, the horn players are playing in a, in a different key? To them, their key is different than the key that you're playing in. Can you see where that can be confusing? That's uh, transposing instruments. Right. So when a trumpet player or, or saxophone player, they may be playing, it might be a, like a B flat horn. That means when they play a C, we hear it as B flat. Try to wrap your head around that. If you're so, so if I'm in the key of C and they're in the key of C, we're not going to match. We have to pick two different keys so that the final outcome, the final music that comes out sounds the same. It's very confusing. And at first it took a while to wrap my head around it. So I have an idea. I go to the horn line, talk about it, and I couldn't communicate. Well, how about this vocalist? <laughs> Try, trying to explain a rhythm or those kind of things to a vocalist is really difficult. But where it really got hard for me was harmonies. If I was doing background harmonies over a certain chords, understanding chordal and vocal harmony, uh, I had to relearn the a language to be able to talk to other people that not guitar player language. And this is one of the things where music theory is fantastic. Music theory helped me the most with communication with other musicians. I didn't know that I needed that at first. Uh, music theory can be fascinating. And if you let it though, it can take over. You can go down certain roads and it's kind of hard to get back <laughs> where you're, where you're, uh, where you're wanting to get on the road. Uh, it, the roadmap in the academy does this. It gives you 
this language. We learn the guitar in a way that's not just the tablature and, you know, the mimicking stuff. I, I'm playing third fret on the A, fourth fret on the D. That's great. But think of that as shorthand for the guitar. It's guitar and bass uh, specific, the tablature stuff. No other instruments care about that. There are my three things I wish I knew ahead of time that took me a long time to uh, master. Things I wish I worked on in the beginning. I knew what I was getting into uh, ahead of time. And, uh, and, we, and you get them. I got them over time. But I want to help you get past these things and, and understand where it is you're heading. We talked about coaching today. Coaching was kind of the theme. My one-on-one coaching, which also has some private group classes and a lot of cool stuff. That's at playguitaracademy.com forward slash play slash guitar slash coaching. You can go and fill out an assessment. I'll take a look at it and I'll get right back to you and we'll see if it's a good fit for each of us while it's available. This is a special day for me and I'm glad I got to share it with you today. So I'm going to call it. That's a wrap. Thanks for joining me today for the Play Guitar Podcast with 300 episodes. Make sure to hit the button below to subscribe to the show with a million downloads. And if you have benefited from this podcast, please leave a favorable Apple Podcasts iTunes review. It's the best way to make sure we get this valuable content to more guitar players around the world. And if more help, structure, and results in your guitar playing sound good to you, I've got some stuff for you. What are you waiting for? The Academy is here. And join the world's most exciting, carefully planned guitar system. And together, we will build your online home base for guitar. Thanks again. And I will see you on the next episode.